Hello everyone and welcome. Sit back, relax, make a cup of tea or whatever you like to drink and get ready for new stories from Yellowcat. Send your own favorite stories in the comments below and maybe they'll be in our new video. So subscribe to the channel if you're not subscribed yet, let's get started. People on Reddit who quit their jobs in a fit of anger, what happened to the last straw? Part 2. When I was around 20, trying to put myself through trade school, it was hard for me to find a job during the recession, so I took the first one I could get at Starbucks. At first, it seemed quite good. After a week of training that I didn't remember much of because it was too long and not paid for, I was put on register at a nearby location in a nice shopping center in an upper middle class neighborhood. I had worked as a register before, some in places with less, um upscale customers. I don't know what else to say. So it was pretty laid back. Just shout order out, ring people up, pour the coffee, and heat up the sandwiches. Not a bad thing. This is how the first few shifts went. I didn't see the person who interviewed me, which I thought was because she was on a different schedule. I was really pleased because I also got a good amount of money from tips that Friday, which was split up fairly. For a while, I thought it might work out. The next week, I heard that something happened and the manager who interviewed me was gone. I also got my schedule and saw that I had three morning shifts in a row. I didn't really like working the morning shifts, you know, being a kid in night school in my early 20s. But whatever, I thought I was lucky to have a job in that market or whatever it was called back then. So the day of my first morning shift was also the day I met my new boss, which made sense. When I woke up at the crack of dawn, I rubbed sleep out of my eyes and dragged myself in. I was called in by my boss before I began. Before I go on, let me say that she had a bad case of rest in B-Face. She seemed very mean. So, I see your schedule here for three mornings, she asks as she looks down at the day's plans. Do you agree with that? They were trying to get me to take the bait. I thought, oh no, here we go, not having a good start. This week is fine, but I'd rather not do it in the morning because I have school at night. Melissa, the person who interviewed me, said it wouldn't be a problem to book around that. I said it as humbly as I could, even though I was already mad and full of testosterone as a 20-year-old. She sneered at me and said, Well, I'm not her, and if school is going to get in the way of you being on this team, you might not be the best fit. I already hated her. That was bad. I was so angry that I could barely hear what was being said after the last few words. And we're looking at putting you on the bar next week. You're all set. I hadn't even thought about being trained to work at a bar before they switched me there. From what I had seen, it looked way too complicated for my taste, especially in this suburban neighborhood where everyone wanted nine pumps of different drinks like soy milk, two shots, macchiatos, or whatever the F. I said no, I haven't been trained. She gave me a blank look and then went back to her work on the computer. Not looking up for a few seconds, she finally said, You can leave. I walked away. The barista who was going to teach me met me outside the back room and said in a low voice that she might be a bee. I agreed, saying that it seemed likely. The barista then set up the register while she quickly went over everything she did. There are already a lot of people outside about five or ten minutes before the store opens. As the people line up, I start to watch. When it's time to open the doors, there's a line that goes around the very corner of the store and out into the distance past the door on the far right. From what I could see, there were already at least 35 to 40 people in line. I turned around and asked the barista if this was normal, cutting her off from her constant stream of conversation. She said it really was. That's when I realized this might not go on for as long as I thought. I went home and slept very well until it was time to catch the bus and go to school. That morning, I had to take what felt like hundreds of orders while listening to training for baristas that I couldn't get while working. The next week, I got my new schedule, which included four morning shifts in a row. I was so mad that I called in sick right away for three days in a row. The shift manager came out and talked to me when I finally got to work on the fourth morning shift. He was a kiss a who believed his job at Starbucks was way too important. You must have an autoimmune disease to be sick this much, he made a joke. Not amused, I didn't say anything and just looked at him with hate in my eyes. At this point, the real manager also shows up to tag team. You ready to start bar today? She laughed. The line was already there when I looked outside. It was even earlier than last week. Today was going to be a terrible morning. No, I haven't trained enough because I have a cold to feel ready to do that yet. 
I'm sorry, I said it with my teeth. Well, whose fault is that, she told me. At this point, I knew I was going to lose it. As soon as I thought about what I was going to say, I stepped closer to her, even though I knew it was a bit too close, and almost yelled, F you and your ass job, you effing B. The room, which had been noisy from the store, went silent as everyone looked at the manager. I must have been high at this point because the stupid jerk's jaw dropped and was still open in shock. I don't think anyone had even replied to her, let alone done it that way. I almost felt bad, but I didn't. As I turned to leave with a bang, I thought of the shift manager and said, an F you too. I pointed at him and then left. My boss was a lot like JP from Grandma's Boy, but we worked at Wendy's. In any case, one night the floor needed to be cleaned, and he told each person to do it, but they all said no. I told him I was on break when he got to me, but he told me to stop and clean the floor. I think he yelled at me and gave up on everyone else who said no to him except me. I left while dinner was still going on. There was no way for me to make money after getting into my parents' car, so I thought it was the worst thing that could happen. My dad was mad that I quit, and he told me I had to go back to work for at least two weeks, two weeks notice. I went back and worked one Saturday, and then I got a job at Burger King across the street. A few days later, that manager was fired because he was a jerk. I got a job at Burger King, and he got a job right next door at Taco Bell. He did come over and apologize, but the damage was already done. How bad is the homeowners association in your neighborhood part two? I'm writing about my former homeowners association. I am so incredibly relieved to be gone. Thus, Jim, Chris, and Rose headed the HOA board I used to serve on. The ages of Jim, Chris, and Rose were roughly 30 to 45. One year, I had a bonfire for my birthday, so at 2 p.m. I was using a buzzsaw to cut wood in my backyard. Jim walks up to me and says, Hey, OP, could you please not use that? I'm attempting to go to sleep. Please, just give me five minutes. I'm almost finished. Yes, that's not an issue. I appreciate your understanding, said in the most patronizing tone I've ever heard. Rose and Chris appear and threaten to call the police for a noise complaint if the person doesn't stop using that immediately, not even two minutes later. Mm Mm-hmm, go ahead. They haven't yet. When my party finally arrived, it was around 5 o'clock. I started my fire at around 7 o'clock in the evening. There were about 7 of us in total in my driveway, and we were all enjoying ourselves greatly while barbecuing. About 10 minutes when we all started to die out, so everybody had left but my girlfriend and me, I'm smoking a cigar and drinking a beer as we sit outside in the driveway. It had been approximately 20 minutes since we had spoken to each other. A Crown Victoria pulls into my driveway at about 10.50 and the officer gets out and essentially tells me to shut up because people are trying to sleep. Who called? I knew. Rose and Chris were there. They had it coming. Every New Year's Eve, there was a block party in my neighborhood. The only house without an official invitation was mine. Of course, I decided not to go, but I got my retribution for my birthday. In my neighborhood, which is highly intolerant of fireworks, my neighbors were launching bottle rockets all night long and acting in a generally unruly manner. I filed a noise complaint with my sheriff's office as soon as 11 p.m. arrived. Oh, and I also said that some inebriated individuals were waking me up by shooting bottle rockets into the air. After about 15 minutes, an officer arrives by car and ends the celebration. It was awesome that Jim and Chris were fine for using fireworks. Screw them. I own the house my parents live in and on occasion have to deal with their HOA. The HOA in the neighborhood where my parents live isn't terrible, but they do have some annoying habits. One quirk is that you can't park on the street overnight. It's not a big deal. My parents park their two cars in the driveway or garage. But sometimes people don't care about the rules and park in the street. Next to my parents' house is one of their favorite spots. They live in a corner. When the HOA hired a new management company in 2014, they made the choice to be stricter with cars. Now, a fair HOA would put signs on the cars that were left out in the street all night, so these guys chose to send letters to the homes where the cars were parked. We start getting mail about the cars that park next to my parents' house all night. I emailed the HOA and told them that these are not my parents' cars. I also suggested that they put the signs on the cars instead of assuming they belong to the people whose homes they are parked next to. 
It got notice of more things and I sent more emails. I'd be told that they would take care of it and let the watchdog in their neighborhood know that those cars were not my parents. Then one day, we got a letter telling us we were being fined. I stopped being nice about the notices after that. The HOA waived the fine, but then told my parents to keep an eye on the street next to their house and follow people who park there. They were told to write down what house the person went to and then tell the HOA about it. I told them in a rude way that the only window that looked out onto that side of the street was in a bathroom and that I wasn't going to make my 70-year-old mother stand in her bathtub all day to spy for the HOA. Instead, I suggested that they just put signs on the cars. I think that someone has to be functionally R in order to be qualified to work for the company that runs this HOA. The argument stopped, though. My wife and I had recently purchased our very first house. It was a new construction, and it was an HOA property. As a result of the fact that we had never been a part of an HOA, we did not know much about it. Now that the construction is finished and the house has been purchased, we were getting ready to move in. It had been a week since we moved in, and we have received a nasty gram informing us that we're required to clean out the garage and upload a picture demonstrating that we're able to park a car there, despite the fact that the garage is not for storage. While we were still in the process of moving in, our boxes from the previous move were still all packed up and in the process of being unpacked. Following the removal of all the boxes, I dragged the vehicle into the garage, took a picture of it, and then forwarded it to them. After that, I went to the subsequent board meeting and hurriedly found a seat. I gained a position on the board, and for the subsequent two years that I served on it, I advocated for each and every homeowner on each and every issue that was brought up, regardless of the nature of the problem. In the majority of cases, I was successful in obtaining the desired outcome for the homeowner. Since we're moving into our first home together as newlyweds, I have never been more enraged than I was when I received that letter. Despite the fact that sitting on the board was a pain in the rear end, I made it a point to represent every homeowner in the most effective manner possible against those power-hungry individuals. I will never again reside in a home that is controlled by a homeowners association, even though we ended up living there for 10 years before selling it. I used to live close to campus in a lovely townhouse development while attending college. In fact, the community was a very pleasant blend of retired people and college students, since this wasn't the kind of place where we terrorized our more adult neighbors with endless parties, we got along pretty well. However, one of my neighbors was an absolute D, who was a middle-aged divorced man whose only goal in life seemed to be to become the homeowner association tyrant. He was the type of person whose irritating nature made it difficult to be around him in a room without gritting your teeth. He started acting like a stalker after I moved in. He made it his mission to record every move that I and my roommates made. He carried some chalk to mark the tires of cars in public areas so that they won't park there for an extended period of time, and he kept a notebook in which he kept track of our arrivals and departures. He would unexpectedly enter our homes in an attempt to catch us in mischief. However, we were moderate drinkers and partygoers, and I worked two jobs in addition to my full-time studies. Not that we were a frat house. Eventually, he was elected president in an uncontested HOA election. He established a rules committee, and he and another D with similar views would conduct twice-daily inspections, noting even the smallest infractions, such as unauthorized decorations or gardening, or parking in a spot for an extended period of time. As a student, I did not drive every day. Instead of going door-to-door, he would scribble the note on a violation sticker that he would stick on your door. He was eventually fired from the board after it was discovered that he was looking through windows of houses to find infractions. Too many people had had enough of his ass. Years later, I was so happy to learn that he had been arrested for being a peeping Tom. If you want to watch the part one, click the link here. Thank you for subscribing, likes, and comments. We're very happy to see you all in the comments too. Thanks for your support.